Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Weistuck. I'm the interim executive director of the Skirball program, and I'd like to welcome you all here to what promises to be a very exciting program. Uh, before we uh, begin, I'd like to uh, make a few announcements. Uh, I know that, you know, you're probably familiar when you go to shul to have the announcements after the, uh, the program, but uh, with Skirball we do it differently. So I wanted to call to your attention several things. Uh, first of all, this is the um, concluding lecture in a series that's been going on uh, the entire year, uh, which is a uh, partnership between the Skirball Center and the Jewish Publication Society. Uh, it's our inaugural year with this partnership, and we have had uh, uh, a series of uh, scholars uh, uh, presenting their new publications to us. And uh, I want to thank uh, Barry Schwartz, who is the uh, uh, president of the director of the uh, of the Jewish Publication Society in uh, bringing this program to us and. Uh, uh, for all his cooperation and uh, hard work in seeing it uh, come to fruition. Uh, and I also would like to tell you that we have uh, uh, video recorded all of these uh, programs this year, and so you can find uh, uh, recordings of them on the Skirball we website, and that's uh, adultjewishlearning.org. And um, this is uh, the next to last, the penultimate uh, program for our year. Uh, we have another program coming up on June 10th. There is a flyer at the door. Uh, hope you were able to find it and pick it up. Uh, it will be a, a conversation between Rabbi Mark Schneier and Imam Shamsi Ali, uh, reflecting on a book they uh, co-authored called Sons of Abraham. Uh, so that's on June 10th at 7 p.m. <clears throat> then um, there is a brochure that describes the Skirball summer session, which takes place throughout the month of August, uh, Wednesdays in August. And uh, we invite you to pick up the brochure um, and uh, search through it, and hopefully you'll find a, a, a course there that is of interest to you. Um, and lastly, uh, Dr. Calderon's uh, book, uh, A Bride for One Night, will be available after the program uh, for purchase and for Dr. Calderon to, uh, to autograph for you. So uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce our senior rabbi, Rabbi Joshua Davidson, to uh, introduce the rest of the program. Thank you. Good evening. Let me add my welcome to all of you and my thanks to Dr. Mark Weistuck, one of the founders and this year, of course, the director of the Temple Emanuel Skirball Center, and to Rabbi Barry Schwartz for this extraordinary gift, this partnership between the Center and the Jewish Publication Society. To say that we are in for a treat tonight would be an understatement of considerable magnitude. <laughs> Elected in January, 19, in January 2013, Dr. Ruth Calderon is one of the most dynamic individuals ever to join the Knesset, where she serves as deputy <laughs> chairperson and as a member of the Education and State Control Committees. She's also a chairperson and founder of the Knesset Lobby for Jewish Renewal, as well as the Lobby for Parliamentary Culture. And she heads the Australia-Israel Friendship Association. An MK who understands our commitment to social justice and religious pluralism, she initiated a constitutional law proposal aiming to anchor Israel's democratic and Jewish values in the Israeli Declaration of Independence, which emphasizes equality, diversity, and freedom of religion. For more than a decade, Dr. Calderon has been a leading voice in efforts to revive a pluralistic Israeli Jewish identity. 
In 1989, working with an Orthodox colleague, she pioneered the first Israeli secular pluralistic and egalitarian Beit Midrash for women and men. She wrote and published and hosted a TV show on classic and modern Jewish texts. In 1996, she founded Alma, a home for Hebrew culture, where I know a number of you actually were privileged to study with her. Raise your hand if you see. You have your groupies here. And she was appointed head of the cultural and education department at the Israeli National Library. Dr. Calderon received her PhD in Talmudic literature at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She's also a graduate of the first class of the Mandel School for Educational Leadership, a recipient of the prestigious Avi Chai Prize in recognition of her contribution to the propagation of the legacy of Israel. And last week, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Jewish Theological Seminary here in New York. And she is about... And she's about to receive another one from the Hebrew College in Boston. <laughs> Dr. Calderon has electrified the Jewish world with her passion to bring Talmud and Jewish texts to all Jews, regardless of religious observance or affiliation. As you will see, in A Bride for One Night, published in Hebrew in 2001, and now in English, thanks to JPS, she offers a richly imagined, provocative, and fascinating window into some of the liveliest and most colorful Talmudic legends, drawing us into this text, which is, of course, at the foundation of our tradition. The first person ever to teach Talmud to the Knesset. <laughs> That's true. Tonight, she teaches us. Ladies and gentlemen, in conversation with, Ra with Rabbi Barry Schwartz, please welcome Dr. Ruth Calderon. Good evening, and thank you, Rabbi Davidson. How wonderful to conclude this first year of the JPS Skirbel partnership with Ruth Calderon. We're very fortunate in between those honorary doctorates to have her speak to us this evening. And JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, the nation's oldest not-for-profit Jewish publisher that just celebrated its 125th year we're so fortunate. Thank you. To be able to bring to the English reading world uh, her book. This evening, we're going to begin with a excerpted reading from one of her stories. We'll ask Ruth to comment on that story. And then Ruth's request was not to give a lecture but to have a moderated discussion. She asked me to prepare that discussion, and I am very glad to accede. This story from the book, which will be available, there'll be a table with the books for sale and another table for Ruth to sign. This story is called Sisters. And this, book, this story actually is based on the biblical ritual that is mentioned in this week's Torah portion. The difficult and enigmatic ritual of the bitter waters, Sota, that is instituted when a woman is suspected of adultery. I'm going to read the terse, enigmatic text from Midrash Tanchuma, the source for the story, and then I'll be asking Carol Hupping, the managing editor of JPS, and Sarah Kroloff-Siegel, our director of communications and development, to read the Midrashic expansion that Ruth offers. Sisters. A story is told of two sisters who resembled one another. One sister was married and lived in one city. And the other sister was married and lived in another city. The husband of one grew jealous of his wife 
and wanted to bring her to Jerusalem to bring to drink the bitter waters. That sister went to the city where her sister lived with her husband. Her sister said to her, why do you see fit to come here? She said to her, my husband wants me to drink the bitter waters. Her sister said, I will go in your stead and drink. She said to her, go. She dressed herself in her sister's clothes and went in her stead. She drank the bitter waters and was found to be innocent. She returned to the home of her sisters who came out happily to greet her. She embraced her sister and kissed her on the lips. When they kissed one another, her sister breathed in the smell of the bitter waters and immediately she died. So Sarah and I will now read an excerpt of Ruth Calderon's retelling of that story. Sometimes even, even mother could not tell the difference between my young sister and me. As children, we used to dress in each other's clothes and confuse the neighbors. Even so, she was always the prettier one. She got married before I did, though this was not the custom where we lived. I am the older. My sister's husband was a wealthy Torah scholar from a good family. As she was wont, she captured his heart easily and effortlessly. Swarms of suitors buzzed around our house, thirsty for the sweet nectar of her glance, for her laughter, for the shine of her flowing hair. Only the shy men would pay attention to me, the oldest sister, the ever patient virgin. Eventually, one of them settled for me. I married without passion or affection. When my sister showed up at our home, my husband was away on business. I did not yet have any children. My sister entered, looking pale and thin. She told me about a peddler of perfumes who had passed through her town. Her husband, immersed in Torah, was always at the study house. The peddler returned several times. Their chatting led to more chatting until she bared all her secrets and her soul became bound up in his. They were alone together, secluded. My sister's words moved me deeply. She begged desperately for my help. She had not had her monthly courses for six weeks. And my husband, she added, suspects me, or perhaps the neighbors whispered something in his ear. A wave of jealousy was washed over him, and he wants me to drink the bitter waters in Jerusalem, given to all those wives suspected of adultery. She said that the local court had pressured her to confess and thereby gain release from her marriage, albeit without financial or legal protection. But she feared for the child within her who would be born homeless and fatherless, and thus she would not confess. Swear, uh, fear swept through the room like a cold wind. Dear sister, I said, I will go to Jerusalem in your stead. She glassed, glassed her arms around my neck and kissed me. In the morning, she dressed me in, the, in her clothes, styled my hair like hers, and told me all about her relationship with her husband their terms of endearment, and their way of relating when alone. I committed it all to memory. Her husband would not know the difference between us. The young priests kept their distance as I approached the site of the bitter waters. A priest dressed in a white gown with a stern look on his face recited formulaically, my daughter, if you know that you are pure, then prove your innocence and drink because the bitter waters will act like a dry remedy rubbed upon living flesh. If there is an injury, it will be healed. 
If there is no injury, then it will have no effect. I listened calmly to his words and declared, I am pure. I knew that God is a true God and would not allow me to die. A large crowd had assembled, excited at the chance to witness the trial of a suspected adulteress upon visiting the temple. But I was hardly conscious of their presence. I turned my face toward the Holy of Holies. The most senior priest among them lifted a marble tablet affixed to a ring. With a silver ladle, he brushed dust into a clay cup that was already filled with a half measure of water from the temple sink. He took a parchment scroll with the verses from the Torah about the curse of the adulteress written in ink upon it. Next, he lowered the scroll into the glass of water until the letters dissolved. Then he mixed the dust and ink in the water. He brought the water to my lips and I closed my eyes, feeling as calm and content as a baby nursing at its mother's breast. I sensed the eyes of the crowd on my face and I felt a new beauty spreading from my lips to my whole body like a wave of warmth, the water in my mouth tasting as salty as seawater or as a man's body. Suddenly my face lit up and I opened my eyes. She is pure, I heard the priest declare. Immediately my husband, her husband, embraced me and lifted me off my trembling feet to the space outside the sanctum. His embrace was like a reward. She shall be absolved and shall retain seed. I hoped that the blessing would be fulfilled and that I would give birth within 10 months. The days of the journey back to my sister's husband's home passed quickly. I was sad. I wished I had more time before I had to divest myself of of this life and give back the husband, the home, and the new heart beating inside me. And behold, Now we were approaching the gates of the city, the market square. She and I had arranged that she would wait inside her house for me. We passed through the gate to the courtyard. I heard her footsteps approaching. My heart was overflowing with joy. In just a moment, she would come out and I would greet her with a kiss. Ruth Calderon, what drew you to this story of sisters and the bitter waters? It's frightening to drink water now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We studied Sota in the Bet Midrash in Elul many years ago. Every year we would take a tractate. Tractate? Tractate. Tractate, and we would study it for the year. And the Tractate of Sota was something, I think the, the Orthodox man, this is not enough? I hear myself too loud. Is this okay now? Um, the, the Bet Midrash where I was studying, Elul, was half uh, non-religious and half religious, and the, the religious half was mostly men that came from yeshivot. They were used to studying Talmud. But I think they never studied with women, and especially the Tractate of Sota and all the others that deal with women. It was, I think, the first opportunity for me to understand what they think when they read it, and for them to hear what women think when we read it. And it is very difficult to read the whole concept of Sota, which mean, which says that if a man is suspicious. Um, the, the spirit of being suspicious, they are trying to decide whether it's a, an air of uh, holiness or of ruach tahara, ruach tum'ah, or is it an air of, uh, of tum'ah, of impurity? impurity. What, what, what happens to us, if I may talk about all of us as uh, Talmudic men, what happens to us when we're jealous and when we suspect our loved ones? And they know that the minute you are full of suspicion, suspicion, suspicion. there's something, something bad happens to you, something that is 
impure. It's a little bit like the, all the talking about uh, modesty, that are very immodest. <laughs> to talk about modesty is something that is very the opposite of modesty, because when they try, start talking about how far should the elbow go, and you know, it's, it's not a modest conversation. And the same goes with sota. And while the Talmud is aware of it, and I try to not read it only as a woman and to get hurt by non-feminist uh, um, sides of the Talmud, but I try to also read it as a Talmudic man and, and learn what I can learn from it about my life today. Um, and so about what I learned about suspicion is that the minute you test your partner or lover or friend, you lose already. The minute you go into someone's mail or phone or uh, whatever is today's uh, suspicion, it is already terrible. It doesn't matter what you found there. Um, but on the women's side, I felt that the, the women of that time, and I'm afraid it's not completely different today in many communities or in many cultures. There's one, there's the love of one man and the women are competing for him and the sisterhood um, is very difficult to acquire because there's, it's like any um, low caste, like when they're slaves, they usually do not work together because they are fighting each other to get whatever the little that there is for them. And the same goes for women. Um, and I was looking for the place in the story, which is originally a frightening story, and a story that aims to frighten. It says to the woman, if you think that you can um, trick us and let your sister drink, even if we will not know it until you get there, the water itself will, it, you, there's no way to escape us. I did not, I was not uh, thrilled about this lesson of the story. <laughs> and what I do when I'm not, uh, when I don't find that this Torah could be Torah for my life, I go on studying until I try to find something else. And what I did find in the second or third reading is that there is a sisterhood here that is not uh, to be taken for granted that a woman is willing to risk a life for another woman. And that the minute there is sisterhood, the man cannot rule over them. The minute there is solidarity, it's the same with workers, with unions, with feminism, with anything, with the black people. When there is solidarity, then the, the, whoever is occupying them is usually not as strong as them. They're, they're just using the fact that they're not together. And so I tried to bring out the story of them being together. And in my uh, storytelling in the book, she did not die. I mean, I stopped the story before she dies because I don't want to cooperate with the storyteller. Uh, I can't, well, so I can't change the story. That's what's written. But one of the ways to do Midrash is to just stop in a different place. And so I stop before they kiss. <laughs> and I want to give the example of a story of how we can help each other, although it is a, still a men's world in many ways, and Knesset <coughs> too, how when we are together, we can uh, change the ending. Yes. So that was what brought me to the sisters. <clears throat> now, you'll find that many of the stories in this collection are what I would call edgy, somewhat risque, that involve unusual relationships between men and women. It's a very arresting group of tales that Ruth Calderon has mined. And then as you just heard her say, you sense that she reads them one, two, three, multiple times and wrestles with them. Ruth, my, my first question is, in the introduction to the book, 
you use an, an arresting phrase. And I almost decided that that should be the title of the book or the subtitle. But we went in a different direction after discussion and went with your original suggestion. But the phrase that you use is reading the Talmud barefoot. Explain to us what do you mean by that expression? Because I know it's important to you and it's important to the methodology of the book. What do you mean as one of the first women to earn a PhD in Talmud in Israel, reading the Talmud barefoot? Barefoot uh, reading of Torah is a term that was also uh, worked on in Elul. This is 25 years ago. When we, half of us, as I was saying, did not grow up in religious uh, educa Jewish education. So when we came to the Talmud, we were barefoot in the sense that we, did, we never learned it before. And when we saw the text, we didn't immediately jump to Maimonides or to Rashi or to any other Rishonim or Choronim commentary. We just saw what's written there. And what was surprising to us is that the, the guys that came from Yeshivot, they were looking at the text, but they saw what they already learned. It was like they're coming with shoes to, to the text. And although usually people think that the ones that get more Jewish education have a Yitaron, advantage. an advantage in, in study, what we found is that Many times, intelligent people that know how to read text, if they come to the Talmud barefoot and never studied it before, they have an advantage because they actually read the pshat. And many times when your uh, kindergarten teacher told you something in the Bible, when you read the Bible, you already see it in it, although it's not written. Like all the, you know, all the different stories that we know about Abraham and stories that are kindergarten stories that whoever came with it came with a rich um, knowledge uh, around the study. But when you come barefoot, you read what there is there. And sometimes you can understand the Talmud in a new way that is, I believe, sometimes closer to what the writers of the Talmud meant than the tradition that always reads it with the bottom line of now you have to be rabbinic and the rabbis are usually right. And uh, it, when I felt that, that reading it barefoot gives me an, um, more opportunity or more chance to bring, it, to bring my, my life to it and bring it to my life and make it a living Torah and not an academic kind of study or something like you study about Indian old myth. It's not that for me. It is, it is material to live my life. And in order to do that, I try to, and that's also my academic work, uh, to touch what there is there, not the layers that got on top of it between us, which is also something wonderful to study. I have nothing against it, but this is barefoot reading. I just want to add that many people here studied with me, and I have a, a dilemma of uh, written Torah versus oral Torah. Because when we study, every time we study, it comes out different. Because of the people in the room and what we thought and what happened that week and the portion and the life and the news. But when you write a book, you have to freeze one option. And I was really worried that if I'll freeze this option that I thought one day, Another day that I'll, I'll want to read it and I wanted to, to feel differently to a sister, I won't be able to do it. There's something very beautiful in the fluidity of those miniature stories that are like you have to add water and, 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 and shake it to, to drink it. And they give it without the water. Now, if I add water and freeze it, then I'm kind of having the problem of a written Torah and somebody will write something on, on that. But I managed to, uh, I, I really was very thrilled about the idea that there will be a book and that I can talk to people that I don't meet. It's an amazing idea in English. <laughs> Somebody will read the book somewhere and, and uh, like we're talking. Uh, and, and that made me 
uh, give up the, this fluidity, although when I teach, I forget what I wrote exactly there, and it can go. When I teach, I don't know where it will go today. If we would now just study that text, it could go anywhere. Um, that's the strength of this text that is stronger than the telling of the story, mm. I, I believe. I, another thing I want to say is that Ilana Kurshan is the amazing, talented uh, translator that translated my book to English, and I think it's better than the Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank her and you. Ruth, so let's take a step back. How did a nice Israeli Sabra like yourself secular Sabra, I might say. How did you become captivated by the, the world of Torah and, and Talmud? Tell us a little bit about your journey and whether it's completely singular or whether others have had the similar journey that you have. When you have your journey, especially when you are young, you don't know that others are doing the same thing at the same time. It's kind of an ugly duckly story. That until you find the swans, you don't know who you are, <laughs> or the ducks, or whatever. Um, I was growing up in Tel Aviv. I still live in the same uh, apartment I was born in, my parents' apartment. And I was, as you say, in a strictly mainstream secular uh, community very army-oriented, because it was a community that Ben-Gurion built for officers that came out of the army. And we were a special family in there. My, my father was not a military person at all, a little bit on the contrary. Uh, and he came from agriculture and just got an apartment there. So I grew up in, a, in the scouts, in, the, in school, in very Zionistic and heroic kind of uh, upbringing. But at home, there was always a grain of salt to all this passion about being strong. And my father came from Bulgaria. My mother came from Germany. They were both not rabbinic and not religious. We did not uh, visit the synagogue um, unless my grandfather would come and uh, take me with him, and we would collect uh, candy. <laughs> Until one day, the, some men told me, I was maybe seven, he told me, you're too old to be here with the men, go upstairs. And I didn't enjoy that at all. I was uh, very angry, and I think that was near the end of my relationship with the synagogue. Um, but my Jewishness was something that always intrigued me, partly because we never studied it in school, and it didn't exist at home. I mean, we studied a lot of Bible, as Israelis do, um, and a lot of Hebrew literature, but the rabbinic texts were taken away from us intentionally by our educators because they did not want the next generation of Israelis to be um, diaspora Jews. They wanted them to be this new Jew that they were inventing. And they were afraid that the material is so strong that it will be viral and we will catch it if we study it. So it was like the, the, the sleeping beauty with the thing. You, you couldn't find it anywhere. And when you hide something like that from young people and they're curious, it's the best way to get them to study. <laughs> because I, it took me years, and seriously, to find a book. Where, where, at home, there were books about uh, insects. My father was an entomologist. Anything you want to know about bugs, <laughs> we had them. And my mother had all the uh, literature in German and in France, in French, in French, and in English and whatever. And there was a lot of Hebrew literature, but there was no Talmud. I went to school and I asked at the library, do you have a Talmud? They said, no, we don't carry it. Maybe the, the library in the neighborhood. I went to the library. In the, there was nowhere to, it was nowhere to be found. So I thought, what are they, why are they hiding it from us? And there must be something interesting. Mm. <laughs> and I, I can't really put my finger exactly on, the, on what it was, but I felt there is something that belongs to me, that is part of me, and that I need to reclaim. And where to find it, I, don't, I didn't know. I tried to go. It's not such an interesting story because it took years of a child, and nobody really pays attention to you when you're 11. 
You know, many of my best thoughts were when I was 11, but nobody was <laughs> listening. And one of it was that I wanted that. And so I went to the synagogue, and it wasn't so pleasant. I went to this religious seminar that they took us from school, Orthodox seminar. And in the beginning, I was very excited, because I felt this is beginning to look like what I'm looking for. And then I felt the manipulation, and I didn't appreciate it. And I remember on Shabbat, I hitchhiked from Tzfat home, <laughs> because I felt they are, I, I wouldn't have in Judaism someone manipulating me. I felt mm. it's too, it should be clean. And so it took me years until I was in the army that accidentally I heard a teacher, Ari Elon, that was teaching Talmud, and I said, where can I study like that? And he said, there's a place in the north, you know, Ranim, they study like that. I took my uh, backpack, I hitchhiked the next day, it was still allowed at the time, to the north, and I started studying there for some five, seven years, and then I moved to Jerusalem to the Talmud department, still in the quest for the Talmud, and I was the only one there without a beard. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, when we'll talk about the cover of the, of the book that has to do with that. I felt very different, and they knew all kinds of things I didn't know, and they were very proud of their yeshiva education, so they would never say where they are in the page. So the, the, start, the class would start, it would take me like 40 minutes to realize where are they, because you know, it's not uh, elegant to, tell, to, to say where in the page are you, are you holding. And after some years, I was able to gain the understanding and the Aramaic and so forth. But I felt the way they study is not the way I was looking for, because they're studying it as academia, as research, uh, of when did the Vav become Yud, and did the, is this, and ins they inserted this in Babylon. That was a very interesting, but not what I was looking for. And I wanted to study the Bet Midrash, in Hebruta, in pairs, and to study mileage of Talmud, not just pieces of, and I was at the Hartman Institute for a few years where there was the first Bet Midrash they let me in. Because to the usual yeshivot, I was not very much invited, both because I'm a woman and because I'm secular. And I, I, I watched the movie Yentl, and I thought of the, op of the option <laughs> to dress as a man, but I didn't think I would pass. So uh, after Hartman, I uh, decided to build a Bet Midrash of our own, to not be always, as secular people, not always be guests by someone else, but be like in Zionism, have our own place, be free. And I did uh, invite a fr uh, an Orthodox colleague, and we ran it together for the first seven years. And there uh, in Elul was really the, in Oranim and in Elul was the first time that I could do it my way. And uh, the, the second part of your question, then I understood that it's not only my problem and that there is a whole generation of Israelis that now you say that JPS is 120 years old, which is two Israels. <laughs> and Israel is young, and the first generation just had to, to concentrate on building an army and, and, and life and strength. And now there was our generation that felt okay, so we live here and we feel safe, uh, usually. Um, now, why are we here and where did we come from and who are we? And like it led me to look for the depth of, it's like going to a psychologist and suddenly realizing you have another mother or father that nobody introduced you to. You have a grandmother that you didn't know about and she's and so you know more about who you are. And it, I understood that it happens to many other people but me. After Elul, a hundred places of uh, secular Jewish studies have started in the country. And, and then Alma in Tel Aviv, and many people who are making art, movies, uh, fiction, writing, poets, musicians, and so forth, came to study and then 
brought the study into the art, and that came back through the radio and television and music and film in Israel. It's a small country, so it, it's much easier to affect. And slowly I understood going on that, that this is politics of a sort. It's politics with a small p. We are changing the public space. Although I had no political standing, but that, like in feminism, that everything is politics, and the rest is a hmm. short history. <laughs> that is a very revealing story. Uh, I'm, I'm still trying to process the fact that you couldn't find a set of Talmud or somebody to study with in school or in the library. Uh, in, the in, teachers in the... could never teach or read hmm. Talmud, I'm afraid, until today. I don't think many Israeli teachers could teach Talmud. Yeah. So, Ruth, do you, do you still call yourself Chiloni? This was not one of the set questions, but as I'm listening to you, do you still call yourself a, a secular Israeli? And I guess behind that question is, how has this study of Talmud changed you, um, you know, internally? What kind of identity do you have today? If uh, you would ask my father, he would say that he's Jewish. And it's a much better answer than secular or not secular. The whole denomination thing, I, I don't find myself in that, uh, in those drawers. I can be all of them or none of them. I'm post-denominational or pre-denominational. <laughs> I mean. So I'm Jewish. Do I belong to the secular community? Yes. And they feel that's my responsibility. And these are my people. This is my community. I'm secular in the sense, when you say secular in Israel, you mean that you're not rabbinic. You don't have a rabbi, a rabbinic authority in your life. Synagogue is not a place where you connect to your Jewishness. But rather, everything about my life is Jewish. Whatever I do, my politics, my motherhood, my cooking, my writing a contract with you, everything I do, I try to do through the Jewish lens that is being built by study and is still, being, is still in the building. And I, I look at the Talmud and the studies as, a, as treasures of, of of generations that give me advice of how to be a human being and how to be a good person and in all those areas. So secular Jews, and I believe there are many um, like us in North America, and they might be signed into a, a synagogue, but I won't go into America. I, uh, because, this is the, because there's a big di difference between us. In this country, there's a separation of church and state, so the public space is supposed to be neutral. The reason I love being an Israeli so much is that the public space is not neutral. It is full of color and taste and smells, and it's very Jewish. Um, and Jewish and democratic is not an easy task, but, but children are singing the songs and you see them either with the candle or with the flowers or with the costumes or whatever, but it's in the street and you get those Jewish food not in the blue and white aisle, but in the coffee shops and in the <laughs> everywhere, the souvganiot become in like a hundred different fillings and colors and they compete with each other and the minute they go away, Osnei Aman come, uh, Haman Tachin, and they will come with amazing feelings in them. The public space is speaking Judaism. Friday night is not something that you have to decide, stop working and go to shul, but Friday is coming all over you. If you, you can't resist it because the music on the radio changes and the shops close and your mother is waiting for you to have chicken and all the mothers of all your friends are, <laughs> are having chicken at the same time. And the children are coming from the army, so everybody is waiting for the children and we're washing the army uniform. It's something that happens in the streets 
in the movie theaters, in the radio, in the television. You, can't, you, you have to work hard in avoiding the feeling of Shabbat. Or, for example, a month ago, a friend of mine from here came to visit, and it was Yom HaShoah, Holocaust uh, Memorial Day. And there's, uh, first of all, everything is closed. You can't, like here, two days ago, I had the amazing opportunity of two honorary uh, PhDs and sales of uh, Memorial Day. <laughs> you can't get any better than that. <coughs> and in Memorial Day, I saw a sign that says, Happy Memorial Day. <laughs> How in the world can anyone say Happy Memorial Day? Now in Israel, it's not just that you will not say Happy Memorial Day for the Holocaust Memorial Day or the soldiers. There is legislation and the places are closed. You can't go and shop uh, on a Memorial Day and you can't go in the street and have coffee because you think of the families of people that lost dear ones, and the public space is theirs. The story of the Jewish people is told in the street, and not just in the, when you talk in, in synagogue. So uh, I love that. I love the feeling that I'm marinated in <laughs> Jewishness. And, in the sto and when and the Israelis that are not considered very Jewishly learned, but they are full, they are, in this marinada of Bible and Hebrew and holidays and calendar and life cycle events and, and the places that we live in are called in the names of, of text and our names, the names that we are, we are called. And it's all very alive. And to this vivid uh, uh, dynamic living I call secular Judaism. Mm -hmm. So I am second. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was a, a beautiful and vivid uh, description of what you love about Israel. Ruth, uh, what keeps you up at night about, about living in Israel, about being an Israeli? What's, what's the, the other side? What worries you? What worries you as a mother as well? I sleep very well. <laughs> Good. Um, what worries me or the biggest challenges, um, I have now the amazing opportunity to try and legislate uh, and try to find solutions. One of the biggest um, um, questions that are above our heads now uh, are the question of democratic and Jewish uh, state, the, the identity of Israel as a state of all Jews. It's important, I am a Zionist and I believe that it's a homeland of all Jews in the world, not just Israeli Jews. And in that sense, my wish is to be also your voice in the Knesset and not just the voice of Israeli Jews. Um, because I, I feel that you have a share in the project of having a homeland for the Jews, if you want to. So the question of some of the people in Israel that want Israel to be very democratic but not Jewish, they actually want it to be like America, that the public space will be neutral. And I'm afraid of that. I feel there's a, a lot to lose on that side. On the other side, there are people who want Israel to be so Jewish that it won't be democratic. And I'm afraid of that too. And so my worry is how to find the balance, and what I suggested is to go back to the Declaration of Independence, which was an amazing text um, that was balanced between being Jewish and, de and being democratic, and give it a standing of a basic law, of the beginning of our constitution to be written. I unfortunately have difficulty to, to have a majority to sign on the Declaration of Independence, and it sounds weird, but uh, sadly that's the truth, because of the people that don't want it to be a Jewish state and the people that don't want it to be a democratic mm. state. <clears throat> and the sentence that is my aim to pass and is very difficult to pass today is um, a complete equality to all citizens with no difference of uh, sex, uh, origin, or religion. 
and people don't want that to be passed yet. And so that, that worries me, and I don't know if I'll, uh, the forces on the other side are strong on both sides. Uh, that, that's a good worry, no? It is. Stop at that. So is that your ultimate uh, aim, goal, when, when Ruth and I first met, and when we discussed translating her story into English and publishing it, little did I know, never mind did Ruth know, that she would become a member of Knesset. So now that you are a legislator in, in Israel, is, is that your dream for your unique contribution, to be able to pass that resolution in the spirit of the Declaration of of independence, is, is that what you would like to, to be your legacy in the Knesset? No, <clears throat> no this is a huge uh, legislation, but it's not, not for that I came. That is a tool in order to do something even bigger than that. Mm -hmm. What I want to work, what I feel I always worked in, the same project and for the same boss, uh, and I still am in the Knesset, uh, is to make, um, the public sphere of Israel more Jewish in, in, more, in a richer way, and to make the Jewishness of Israel a Jewishness that is enjoyable to live in, that is rich, that is, that is beautiful, that is uh, sensitive to, to people, that is livable. And I do that. We, I'm now working on, I, I already put the, the law, but it was not accepted yet, on uh, civil union that is on the way to civil marriage, but there's no way to do civil marriage at the moment, but uh, to do civil union, so every two human beings could get married in Israel, not needing to go to Cyprus or somewhere. To, today, if you're not married in, a, in an orthodox way, you're not recognized as married, so you have to go abroad. So that's one thing. I work on a big project of Shemitah for next year. Next year is Shnat Shemitah, a year of no ownership. And a lot of money is uh, devoted to that by Israel, that the agriculture will not be in ownership, so there are all kinds of solutions. What I want to do is revive the biblical concept of uh, forgiving debt and to invite families that are in debt to come into a process of a year with a nonprofit organization that will work with them on um, social not social, financial rehabilitation until the nonprofit says to us that this family is now more positive than negative, they earn more than they spend, and then we go with them to it's not, it's not me anymore, because now I have to leave it to the hands of people that will do it. The people will go with them to the bank or whoever they owe, and the, the bank, for example, will forgive a third or more of the debt. The family will give a third of the debt with no interest uh, in a few years, and the people will fundraise and will give them the opportunity to get out of this situation. Now, trying to do that in real life, in real politics, is, is the kind of ideas that I feel it's good for Jewish educators that study Talmud to come into the Knesset. That is quite an agenda. And, and, and we wish you uh, the best with all those uh, things. Let, let me just return for a few moments to, uh, to the book, and then when we wrap up this section, we'll be glad to answer some questions if there uh, are any from you as, as well. You'll notice a, an iconic photo on the cover of this book. We were having discussions about the cover, and, and Ruth came across this photo, and she said, this is it. This is the, the photo that I want on the book. Well, when we investigated this, we found out that this photo by the famed photographer Ruth Orkin was controlled by her uh, archive. She's no longer uh, alive. And we were told um, initially, sorry, it's not available. Uh, 
I instructed my editors to have further uh, discussions, explain what we were asking for. And eventually the answer came back, well, we might make it available, and then the sum of money that was requested was astronomical, something that we could not afford. So I said, I should get on the phone here. I spoke to the head of the, the archive, explained who Ruth Calderon is, what the book is about, what the purpose of this book was about, and in the course of the next 15 or, or 20 minutes, the head of the, the archive, who told me that she was a proud member of the Jewish people, a reformed Jew uh, like myself, glad to meet the acquaintance of a reformed rabbi, she hadn't realized that. In the end, she said, we want to have you use this cover, and she made it available to us at, at almost uh, gratis terms for which we were uh, very pleased and relieved. Because <laughs> you don't like to say no to this Ruth. <laughs> so Ruth, why did you become attached to that photo? Can you judge a book by its cover? And in this case, what does the photo convey that reveals something about the message of this extraordinary book? First of all, the aesthetics of Jewish books in, in this country, for me, are a little too clear that they are Jewish books. Like you usually have a menorah, <laughs> a pomegranate, Moses, and I don't like that because I, I wrote a book and of course it's Jewish because I'm Jewish, but I don't have to say Jewish on it. So the aesthetics of Jewish, Jewish books, I didn't find comfortable. Now this picture is a picture that I was carrying with me, I think 20 years. It's a picture by this lady, Ruth. Orkin. Orkin, and with a, it's a series of pictures that, is, that, that are called American in Rome. And it's an American woman. Uh, and you see her in different situations in Rome that I think were very, um, they were designed, it's not by chance. She, 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 she set it up, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And all of them are beautiful photos, but this photo is a photo of that woman walking in the street. All, she's the only woman in the street. The street is full of, of Italian men <laughs> that look like Italian men. One on a Vespa and a few standing around her. And you can hear them saying things to her or, or whistling. And she's walking by herself. When you see the whole picture, this is a blow up of her, but when you see the whole picture, there is a kind of a very beautiful uh, symmetry and you can't tell if she's enjoying it or suffering. Because mm. she's, she's alone, she's walking, there's a stride of a strong woman, but her face, you don't know if she's enjoying it. And I, I felt that this is very uh, close to the feeling of being the only woman in the, in the room studying Talmud. Mm. Um, the street with the Italian man is very similar to <laughs> the, the, pub, the Jewish uh, public place where they study Talmud is always very male. And the Knesset, the place where power is. In, and I am a daughter of a Sephardi father. It was very clear that where the power is, is, is where the men are. And I had two big brothers that I always was chasing because they, they never took me fishing or wherever they go. So the feeling of I want to play with the boys where, 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 they, where they are, where the real thing is, um, is in some ways similar in the feminist quest and in the Talmudic quest and the, in this uh, picture where I chose to see her walk with its ambivalence, a walk of joy, of, of conquering the, the forbidden street of where my mother couldn't be. Mm. My mother didn't have a PhD, and my mother didn't have a, a bank account, and my mother didn't have a car uh, license, and it's my mother. It's not like seven generations ago. 
And I knew as her daughter, and we were very close, and she didn't talk about it much, but I knew the frustration. I felt it. And I, when I did my PhD, I felt that we were doing it together, my mm. mother and I. When I go abroad, I feel we are going together. Because she loved traveling, and my father always traveled, and she was always at home. And, that, and I'm first generation to that. So the picture of the woman walking in Rome, I identified with. And then I saw a discussion on uh, Facebook. I don't know if you put it in. Uh, someone talked about the book in one of the sites and said, she looks miserable. She looks that she's suffering. And then someone else said that Ruth Orkin wrote that she had a, that she sh it shouldn't be interpreted as a, painful picture, she had the lovely time, and she had a date with a guy on the Vespa. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day of uh, photography. So, so that's why I was so uh, demanding, and thank you so much for finding the way and your magic on, uh, on that woman to, I, every time I see the book, I'm happy. Ah, that's, uh, that, that's wonderful. Uh, so final two questions. The first to follow up on, on what you just said, uh, Ruth, what, what is the, me the, the message of this book for women and for men? The message of this book for Jews <laughs> is that the material is very good, it's good stuff, and that you should just take it to, to, to meet you where you are. It, I don't believe that Judaism is something that you have to go and do things with yourself in order to, to be fit for it. I think it should meet you where you are. And I felt in my life that it, it does that. And it's relevant. It's moving me, changed me in many ways. Not in the way that I became more observant or less observant, but in a million ways of how I do things, what's my priorities, how everything. And so I, I just, you know, I don't have a message in a book, but it's like a, an offer of a, of a chevruta. Come study, Come study. with me. Yes, that's beautiful. Uh, my last question, what is your next book about? <laughs> well, the, this is the beginning of a... Um, a negotiation. negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> I actually... Uh, am, on the verge of finishing, uh, it, it's been 10 years ago that I wrote this book. It's not that I write so quickly. And I don't exactly write books. They accumulate. <laughs> Slowly, there's pieces. This book that I'm uh, now finishing and I'm trying to find the cover for uh, is called Alpha Beta, the Aleph Beta of Talmud. What I did there is a private collection of insights, um, um, heroes, play, all kinds of things by the Aleph Bet that I found in the Talmud and I really loved and I wanted to collect. And I had a little box, I have a little box of Aleph Bet in my, on my desk and I used to collect them so I won't forget. And with time, the same editor that made me write this book asked me to write that book and it's been now oh, seven or eight years that I'm accumulating. And now, again, it's the same feeling that it's not finished and it, I can find other uh, options for pay or for TAF that is better. But at some point, you have to stop and just uh, let it go. So again, it's a similar kind of very private collection. It's not going to tell you what the Talmud is. As this book, you can't read it and understand what the Talmud is. It's a, it's a kind of um, peritif. Uh, getting the taste of it. So, uh, well, we look forward to seeing what's in that box for sure. And now we'd like to uh, open up to uh, a few minutes of uh, questions from uh, the congregation, if you would. Go ahead. Stand up maybe and ask your question. Who would you say your heroes or role models are? My heroes and role models. Um, Rav Yosef jumps to my mind. <laughs> yeah, the, the rabbis that were so radical and rev revolutionary in the way that they built rabbinic Judaism are 
many times my heroes and my uh, I try to to learn from them. The anonymous writer of the stories is for sure one of my heroes. I don't know who they are. It's amazing that they didn't sign such good stories. But the way they write, that is so elegant and like light, very haiku, like the Japanese haiku. They kind of do three lines of drawing and everything is in it. I adore them. And I, I'm not much into heroes. My children, I, I, don't, I don't have a, heroic figures. I think what I love best about the Talmud is that it's very human, and the human phenomena in the Talmud is weak and um, missing opportunities and getting it wrong. And, and you can't not love them. And that's what I love especially. So it's not heroic. It's usually someone that met an angel and, was, and didn't, didn't realize, mm. or didn't come back on time, or his ego was blocking him from really being in the moment. And they, they have this awareness that they do that. It's such a modern way that I, I love them. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, you talk about the struggle between a democratic egalitarian Israel uh, alongside with a Jewish Israel. So I'd like to know your take about those who move from the, the Sudan into Israel who are wow. a democratic egalitarian society, but are most likely not going to become Jewish. But that's my guess is that they're most likely not going to become Jewish. That's a kind of, it's not about the book, but let me try to, uh, to answer. Africa is in a huge... Uh, Mess. People are hungry and sick and uh, enslaved and to the army at the age of eight. Terrible things happen. We are sitting here on Fifth Avenue uh, feeling good about ourselves because we take in 10,000 people and treat them nicely. I don't think, and now to Israel you can walk from Sudan, to America you can't walk. But if you would stand on um, when we come into the airport, you go to the citizen's role, but we go to immigration. It's so unpleasant to come into this country if you're not American. And they give you the feeling that you are a liar, you are going to come and work and take someone's job here. They are very frightening. Many times I thought, you know what? I'm going home. I'm not, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bad feeling. And all the Rich and well-to-do uh, countries are protecting themselves because there's no way that Israel or even America would feed and give jobs and health and education to all of Africa. If you ask me, the answer is to help Africa. Keep the people there and not leave their families. I met children that came through Sudan. Bedouins caught them on the way to Israel raped the, women, the girls, the girls didn't survive, and the boys came with organs taken out of them. They were captive until their mothers in, in not Sudan, in Eritrea, had to pay thousands of dollars, which they don't have, in order to free the child. Terrible, and then they come to Israel. And I, when we asked them, what, what do you want? They said, we want to go back to, to, mama, to mommy. They, it's not about, they don't want a democratic Israel. They want to live a normal life with their families. So I think the eyes of the Western world should go to turn to Africa, to the amazing wealth that we have here. And I'm saying here, Israel or America, that we don't need. And, and to be fair to the rest of the world. So looking only at how many people do you let in and give them their rights, I don't think is a true answer. Having said that, the people that did come into Israel, there's maybe, I don't know how many, uh, must have uh, their rights as human beings to 
work, education, uh, health, and so forth, um, the government is very worried about this uh, moving of people from Africa when the word came out that it's good in Israel and it is walkable. The, the, they started coming in thousands and Israel has trouble you know, giving health what we try to give, which is, as you know, different from America. We, we give uh, health security to everyone and education and so forth. So the government wanted to block it and build the wall. And now the question is what to do if it will really stop the moving in, then the question will be only what to do with the people that are inside, and then you can become much more generous and nice. But when the feeling is, is that you know the size of Israel, it's New Jersey. And if Africa will start coming into New Jersey, uh, when I sit there as someone responsible, and I see people of Israel that are in need, and I know that every thousand new people that come every week uh, will take uh, some of that effort, and that is not the right answer. The right answer is to let them live freely and in, a, in respect in Africa, which we took the, we the West took the, uh, the wealth of the earth from them. We took them as slaves. We did. It's con colonialism that made them uh, live in a terrible situation that they live today. So now taking 10,000 and feeling that we are righteous, I don't buy into that. Mm. Yes. It's a very interesting question. The people that wrote the Agadah, it seems to be, are the same people that wrote the Halakha. And that's quite amazing that they could be, we are usually divided by the people that are in the arts and the people that are in, in math and science. And they are the same person in two hands. Um, I read Halakha and I enjoy, when I read the Talmud, I read it, when I did a daily page, I do it by page. But with the Halakha, there's less uh, artistic qualities to the writing. They don't mean to be a story. They mean to, uh, it's not a lacha, by the way. The Talmud very rarely will say what is the bottom line. They enjoy the discussion. It's very much like a Wittgenstein philosophical question. So if the fly has one wing and still jumps, if we take the other wing, it's not questions that are practical. If uh, you know, an egg was, uh, was born on a holiday, or half a chick was above your, your house, the air above your house, does it belong to you or does it belong to the city? These are questions that I enjoy very much. Uh, I enjoy when they are artistic in that sense, or philosophical in that sense. And I like uh, logica, it's, it was my favorite. Uh, I like thinking like that, and in that sense I love them. But when people take the Talmud and draw it to halakha that is not Talmudic, but later of Shulchan Aruch, okay, so that's what he said that you should do. It's a, I take it as advice. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, Sometimes it suits my situation, sometimes it doesn't. I don't, it's not an authority for me. The last question, yes. You are certainly my hero. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm always in Los Angeles to give this chance. I want to ask And she wrote the daughters of Rashi. To, to study Talmud, which has certainly been my goal for 20 years. What translation, we can't, I mean, we're not going to be in Arabic. Most of us not even going to read Saisal's in Hebrew. We now have choices in English. What would you recommend for people who do want to go to their rabbi and say, I want to study Talmud. How do we proceed 
from, from this point. And there's there's online stuff too now that, that you can do. I'm just wondering, to take it to the masses, how are we going to do it? Um, first of all, thank you for coming. And I want to say that uh, Maggie wrote the, uh, what was the, the name of the first, the Rashi's Daughters. So she made Rashi's Daughters uh, famous, and they are known for wearing tefillin, and they were very interesting uh, ladies. And now there's a new book by uh, Maggie about uh, Rav Chista's Daughters, and I'm looking forward to reading this, so we are sisters. Um, I think through books like yours and mine is the beginning for people who want to you know, to have the milk and not the whole cow. <laughs> I, I don't think that everybody should study Talmud. It's, it's really something for people who are passionate about it and really want to do it because you do need to learn a bit of language. And, um, and Talmud works only when you have mileage. It doesn't work in pieces. You need the, the ongoing page by page. Um, you know the joke, um, that someone goes to, dies and goes up and he goes to the registry and they say, before we'll put you in one place, we'll show you uh, Gan Eden and Gehenom, paradise and hell. So they take him to paradise and he sees the uh, old man sitting and studying Talmud and, and uh, angels walking around the Beth Midrash. Then they take him to hell and he sees old men sitting and studying Talmud and angels going around the so, <laughs> So he asks, what's, what's the difference? It looks exactly the same. So he says, these love Talmud, and they hate Talmud. <laughs> so it's not for everyone, and it shouldn't be for everyone. We don't have to push it to our children. I, I think the, the, the Talmud is so precious and wonderful that it, we don't need to subsidize it. But people who do want to study, it's only about another person that will be studying with them. It is happening, it works in all languages, as Masechet Megillah says, not only in Hebrew. Study Bechol Lashon, and I uh, recommend. Well, we've had a taste of heaven here this evening. My pleasure. Israel and America are in good hands. Please give Ruth an opportunity to go to the back. Once again, thank you on behalf of JPS and Skirball. Good evening.